school on MacroCard. <laughs> so I have a laptop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for everyone for coming to my last speech. Woo! I appreciate it. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm just going to jump right in because um, we've got the slides up. Ron's interrupting. <laughs> all right, we'll forget about that. Um, all right, so I'll just jump right in. You can see the title. So the title of my presentation is Planetary Overuse, A Cautionary Tale. Um, I'm sure this topic isn't new to anyone. Um, so climate change is obviously a big issue. So if we throw aside the debate that is actually happening and agree on the science, 95% of scientists agree that it's happening, so that, that's good enough for me. Um, but what are the causes? So we all know there's a lot of causes going on. We have natural global warming. The planet is just warming by itself. Um, we have human-caused global warming from greenhouse gases and emissions, but really planetary overuse by humans is the biggest cause. Um, so all the causes of climate change, planetary degradation due to overuse is the biggest threat to life on Earth, more specifically. Um, and that life isn't just humans, um, but humans play the biggest part in impacting our environment. So the Earth's human population has grown from around 1 billion in the year 1800 to around 7.5 billion in present day. So that's obviously huge exponential growth um, when looking at any kind of um, inflation of a species. Um, and we've recently been seeing um, mass human migrations, well, not due to climate change, um, the impacts of climate change are obviously going to uh, be compounded by human migration. So we see that in Europe right now. We're seeing that um, people coming from South America or southern parts of North America um, into the United States. So what sparked my interest in this topic was um, an article by John Vidal for uh, the Huffington Post. Um, and he cites that humans make up just 0.1% of known life on Earth, while plants make up 83%. But since humans have dominated the planet, we've seen the loss of 50% of plant species and a significant loss of animals on land and in the ocean. Um, and this graphic was included in the article. And while it's pretty simplistic, I felt like it was really impactful. Um, of wild animals, there's about 85% that have been damaged by humans. Of marine mammals, 80%, 50% of plants, and 14% of fish. Um, and when we think about all of those, um, all of these are sources of food for humans. Um, we humans need water to survive, we need um, protection, but we also And what are the elements of the planet that are affected by our planetary overuse? So we have the ocean and water, um, we have habitable land, and then human health. Um, but beyond that, not just human health, but obviously the health of animals and plants that we share the planet with. So first I want to focus on ocean overuse, and more specifically overfishing. Um, so we often think about the ocean as endless. It takes up 70% of our planet, and we think we can just use it um, as much as we want. Um, but unfortunately, that's not true. And overfishing doesn't just have to do with the fish that are caught, but it's the fish that are accidentally caught, as well as animals that are accidentally caught in fishing. Um, and furthermore, on ocean overuse, is something called ghost fishing. So it sounds weird when you first hear it. Um, but ghost fishing is actually nets and traps that are lost by fishing vessels in the ocean. Um, these are usually lost, obviously, accidentally, um, whether it's due to storms, so they have to cut the nets free, or the nets or traps just fall themselves um, from the boats. Um, and obviously, these nets and traps are catching fish and animals that they need to catch, but um, again, might be accidental. Another big part of ghost fishing is that in the 1970s, nets turned to plastic nets. They were formerly made of cotton or hemp, things that are biodegradable. 
now they're made of plastic. And we all know that the world has a huge plastic issue. And we think about water bottles in the ocean and different things like that, but we forget about all of these nets that have been lost in the ocean um, that are just catching fish in the bottom of the ocean, but there have been no rewards. So the counter argument for overfishing, it's simply fish less. <laughs> but about 30% um, of fish that are caught are caught illegally. And there's no system to, that's been developed to identify where fish came from. So even if you, a business owner, may be intending to buy legally caught fish, you may be inadvertently purchasing illegally caught fish. Um, and passing laws that limit fishing on law-abiding fishers may only increase illegal fishing because it increases the cost and demand for fish. Um, and another counter argument might, might be biodegradable nets. And yes, that would help with the ghost um, net situation, ghost fishing situation, but biodegradable nets are still going to catch fish and still going to catch animals that they don't intend to when they break and get loose. So it's going to lessen the problem as I state, but it's not going to eliminate it. So then we move on to land overuse, and there's lots of ways um, that land can be overused. Deforestation, um, pollution, but specifically I want to talk about desertification. Um, so desertification is when land is cleared and turns into a desert. Um, there's not enough water. There may be a drought that helps accelerate the process, um, but there's lots of land around the world naturally being desertified. Um, but more specifically, we're desertifying areas that have previously been very fertile lands for us. So a specific example of desertification is the Dust Bowl. Um, now, since time has passed, and this was in the time of our grandparents, not a lot of people know about this nowadays. So the Dust Bowl took place in the central United States on the Great Plains, um, and farmers were incentivized to buy plots of land sold at very low costs and move to the Great Plains to farm. This is a semi-arid region already, so already on the tipping point for desertification, but at the same time that all of these farmers moved there, a huge drought hit almost simultaneously. And the stock market crashed. <laughs> so further compounding the issue, <laughs> while economic, not directly related, um, definitely not helpful. Um, so the over-farming and inexperienced farmers moving to this area removed a lot of natural barriers as well as grasses that developed to live in this specific environment. Um, Due to that, led to a lot of malnutrition, um, obviously lost wages, so not only were they not able to grow food, it was difficult to get food to these areas. And based on this photograph, um, that's from the area at that time, from Colorado, um, all of this desertification caused massive dust storms. Um, we all know the Great Plains, they're huge, flat swaths of land. Um, so removing natural barriers like trees that actually do slow down wind um, just created these massive storms. Uh, like we're used to seeing more in you know, the Sahara or the Gobi Desert in the center of the United States. Um, and then furthermore with that led to migration. So there's human migration um, leaving the area. You would think a lot more people left, but only about a quarter of the population actually left. Um, but because there were lots of people leaving lots of areas of the United States. The refugee population exploded because of the stock market falling. People looking for work, not just coming from the Midwest, but coming from all over the United States, so all different areas. Um, but then there was also animal migration. So in addition to rabbits, there was a huge grasshopper situation. <laughs> Sounds silly, um, but they had to call in the National Guard that was literally running them over with um, oh, cars. But then in addition to that, they called out the um, Civilian Conservation Corps, and they were actually spraying arsenic on the land, um, which you can imagine is damaging the soil. But due to these dust storms, it's blowing arsenic around in the air, killing the grasshoppers. Um, so while we were solving the grasshopper problem, we were causing more. Yeah. Exactly. 
Um, so the counter argument to this, so people will say the Dust Bowl's been corrected. Um, that's not entirely true. So the, the drought did end in the 1930s. It was one of the worst droughts that's on human record. So we haven't seen a drought quite like that since then. Um, but really what cor corrected the Dust Bowl was our um, putting in proper farming practices, but also integrating uh, irrigation from specifically the Ogallala Aquifer. So that runs down the center of the United States and has been building up for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, but recently, because of the Dust Bowl, we've been depleting it faster than it can replenish itself. Um, and <laughs> to quote one of my sources, well outputs in the central and southern parts of the aquifer are declining due to excessive pumping and prolonged droughts have parched the area, bringing back Dust Bowl-like storms. Um, and because we're depleting it faster than it can replenish itself, eventually it's going to run out. Um, and we're not going to have a solution unless we put one in place to replace that water. Um, and humans also have a history of prioritizing short-term gains without considering the long-term environmental effects. Um, hopefully that's pretty clear by mm. our chosen solution with the grasshoppers. Um, and that obviously affects land and water use. So, what are the effects on our health? So not just human health, but animals, fish, things like that. According to the World Health Organization, the potential impacts of specifically desertification on health include higher threats of malnutrition from reduced food and water supplies, more water and food borne diseases that result from poor hygiene and lack of clean water, respiratory diseases caused by atmospheric dust from wind erosion and other air pollutants, and the spread of infection diseases as populations migrate. So in the Dust Bowl, we saw populations migrating due to the environmental effects um, and the decline of the economy. But present day, without any of those effects, we're already seeing migrations happening due to war and economic crises. So you can only imagine how a lack of usable land is going to concentrate more people. Um, during the Dust Bowl, they also saw respiratory diseases um, like dust pneumonia, which did actually lead to some deaths specifically in young children and older people. Um, and more water and foodborne diseases is pretty obvious when you <laughs> deplete the land, um, those things are going to grow. Um, and obviously if we don't have hospitable land to life, as I mentioned before, there's no food for, from animals or plants. So I wanted to show this again because, again, it looks kind of cheesy graphic, kind of silly. Um, but when we think about everything that I just discussed, and we think about wild land animals that are damaged, marine mammals, plants and fish, how that affects humans and our food source, um, but again, how we're damaging these species that we're sharing the planet with. Pretty significant. Um, so when thinking about planetary degradation, humans think selfishly about their own survival and their immediate needs. And we often think about our planet in terms of, oh, you know, we're going to use up the planet. The truth is, the Earth was here before humans, and will be here for billions more years. But do humans living on this planet want to cultivate an environment hospitable to the survival of living things? That's a real question that we have to ask ourselves. And due to planetary overuse, misuse, Yeah, for sure. Um, I was interested in this all the way over. Yeah, <laughs> I think it is. She was talking to me about some of this. Yeah. Like, what? Um, 